I'm going to go ahead and kick it off here. Um, welcome to our presentation on growing cut flowers. Um, we're going to cover um, a smaller scale um, production, you know, smaller scale production here. Um, and then we're going to cover from everything from seed to um, making bouquets. And my name is Ian Frederick. Um, I'm the, the manager of the Trailside Organic Farm, um, which is a satellite farm of Rodale Institute. Um, we partnered with Rodale Institute um, here at the retirement community called Cornwall Manor. And we run a small farm here to support um, the residents. And I'm here with Katie Landis, the assistant farm manager. All right, and bear with us. This is our first webinar we've done for Rodale. Uh, we're hoping it's going to be a good one. Um, go ahead and get started. So a few items just for housekeeping purposes to begin. Um, if you have any questions at any point, um, please feel free to ask them. We're here to answer questions and help you learn. Um, but we ask, um, please put them in the Q&A box and not the chat. Um, and during the presentation, we're going to have designated times where Katie and I are going to answer. So yeah, don't, don't feel um, afraid to answer, ask a question. Before we begin, um, just to make this a little bit, um, you know, a little bit, what's the word? Fun. Okay. Yeah, let's say fun. Yeah, <laughs> interactive and fun. I would like to, if you put in the chat, um, number one, where you're from, where you're currently living. Um, number two, are you a gardener? Are you a farmer? Or are you just starting out here? And number three, throw in one thing you hope to learn today. The final item here is that we are recording the presentation right now, um, but you'll be able to view it in about a week. Um, so just go to our education tab on the Rodale Institute website and um, you'll be able to watch it again. All right, let's start from the beginning here. Why exactly do we grow cut flowers on our small farm? Well, I'll start by just describing a little bit about what the Trailside Farm is. And as I mentioned, it's a partnership between Rodale Institute and Cornwall Manor. And it's designed to be a project to engage the residents here um, at the Cornwall Manor campus. So our farm's located on site. It's about two and a half acres. And we're proud to share that we got our organic certification last summer. Mostly we grow diversified vegetables, but um, the flowers were a great fit um, and something that we're actually increasing um, in our production for 2024. So the whole point of the farm here is to foster an environment of longevity and life learning. Um, so not only do we grow uh, produce that um, is available at a farm market for employees and residents here, um, we also produce produce um, to send to the kitchens where food is prepared using um, really local on-site grown organic produce. So it's a great project um, in that regard. But we also offer um, ways for residents to come engage with the farm. And a lot of these people are really outdoorsy. They already garden, they're, um, they like to jog, hike, bike, things like that. So we have volunteer days where residents can come help us at the farm. Um, we have workshops where they can get hands-on with um, farm tasks that coincide with the growing season. We have special events and a lot more. We're the first uh, farm to um, retirement community farm to be partnering with Rodale. And if you'd like to learn more about this specific um, Rodale project, please go um, either to Rodale's website or Cornwall Manor's website. But since this isn't really the focus of this webinar, we're gonna go back to cut flowers. So let's define what farm flowers are, um, just to get us settled here. Um, they're typically easier to grow and on the less formal side of things. And they're flowers that you'd expect to see on a farm. For example, they're not usually roses, dahlias, lilies, um, the more formal flowers you'd see at a florist. 
they're usually things like zinnias, sunflowers, uh, other fillers. Um, those are what farm flowers would be. During our first growing season, we mostly grew flowers as a way to increase biodiversity on the farm. You know, Rodale talks a lot about biodiversity, um, regenerative. So that's why we started growing cut flowers. But we soon saw um, that, hey, you know what? That's a farm product. It's something that we can grow easily. Um, it's a value added product that residents really like. Well, think about it. The demographic here is perfect for flowers. And we soon had uh, residents asking us to grow more, uh, sell bouquets at the farm market. And we use them around campus. We put them on the tables in the dining hall um, in the welcome areas around campus. So it's a, it's a nice crop for us um, in addition to the produce we're growing. Also, um, flowers were a nice backdrop for more engagement opportunities for residents. So we have workshops where residents can um, arrange their own flower bouquets. We're looking into getting pick your own days at the farm. Um, and it's just all in all a great way to expand the, the audience of a farm like ours because flowers make a lot of people happy, even if they're not really into um, you know, eating organic yet, um, but they want to come buy a bouquet or uh, learn about some flowers or buy some flowers. Another benefit we saw is that flowers do well in less than perfect soils like we have. Um, we have a lot of clay, um, not a lot of nutrition or organic matter, but flowers did fairly well our first season here, which was in 2022. Although it's not something a lot of consumers are too concerned about, flowers can be sold as certified organic, and that's how we do it. And it's a good way to support the, the or growing organic industry. Flowers were also an alternative crop uh, for us because we already grow plenty of produce for um, the dining halls here and the, the farm market. So we didn't really need to grow more produce for 2024, but flowers are something that we can add to our three-year crop rotation and break our fields up a bit. Because we do grow a lot of crops in the solanaceous family, um, adding flowers to our field makes it easier to rotate um, down the road. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Katie to talk about flower varieties. Great. So when you're looking about looking for varieties, what you want to grow, you want to be thinking mainly about height or stem length. You uh, want to pick ones that have a longer stem length, obviously. Uh, just make sure you're you're looking at the seed packets or the seed catalogs when you're looking for your flowers. Uh, for example, there are zinnias that are perfect for bedding that you could put in your landscape that are only going to get eight to ten inches tall, but you want ones that are going to be more in the three to four foot range if you're going to be using them for cut flowers. And you also want to think about hardiness. Um, things that are bred for cut flowers are going to stand up straight and be uh, sturdy for a long time. Uh, whereas if you pick something from the wild, like a, a daisy or an aster that's not bred to be a cut flower, it might look great in a vase for an hour or two. Um, and then when you go to sell that bouquet, you have wilted flowers in it and that's not good. And you also want to start with easy to grow varieties. I've listed some there that are some of the easiest ones to grow. Once you get good at it and you want to experiment with dahlias or uh, lilies or things that are a little more complicated, you're welcome to. But definitely start easy. Uh, you'll have better success and that'll make you happier and more likely to continue growing. So this chart shows uh, some of the primary flowers and fillers that we grow on our farm uh, and then their growing characteristics. I know it's probably a lot of information to look at on a Zoom slide, uh, but Ian has his email address down there at the bottom and we'll show it again at the end of this session. Uh, we can send you the presentation or just this chart if you're interested, but uh, it's good to have some information like this, what season flowers are gonna be growing in, how tall they are, what colors they are, things like that, just so you can plan diverse bouquets. Speaking of diversity, when you're picking your flowers, 
You want to go for ones with different characteristics. You can see that bunch of bachelor's buttons up in the corner looks really beautiful, but uh, the, the bouquet down here has more variety and is a little bit more interesting. So we kind of split our flowers into different categories. We have some greens and fillers. We like things with movement. We like tall spiky grasses or celosias, and then the big face flowers like zinnias and sunflowers. You just want to have a good variety to really increase the, the interest in your bouquets. So uh, there are lots of different places you can get seeds. If you do a Google search, a lot of websites will come up. These are some of our favorites. We order most of our seeds from johnnyseeds.com. They have really good prices. They have a ton of variety. They have a lot of information on their website and in their catalog. They're just a really great resource. Even if you get seeds from elsewhere, you can use their resource or their website to reference just for uh, things like flower height, growing time, how long it takes from the time you plant the seed till you can harvest it. Uh, they have a nice tab down at the bottom of the web page there that has growing information that'll show you how deep to plant the seed, how far apart, what time of year, just a lot of really good resources. Another seed source we use is high mowing seeds. Um, and then a few others that we don't use that often, but are also really good resources. Uh, Baker Creek, which is rareseeds.com. They have a lot of unique varieties of seeds, if that's something you're looking for. Eden Brothers has a really well-organized website. And Florette Flowers has a lot of really beautiful pictures and also a lot of good information. And they just do flowers, so that would be a good resource if you're just looking for flower seeds. And then just one thing I want to mention is when you're out in the field, uh, take notes then. Don't think that you're going to remember everything. And then when you're planning in December, you'll you'll have all that information in your head. You're not. You're going to forget things. So write notes. Um, some things you could think about taking notes on is what you like and don't like, what's working, what you want to do differently, what you want to grow more of. Uh, one example I have from this past season, we planted all of our fever few at the same time. And then we had a lot of really beautiful fever few to harvest for a few weeks in July. And then after that, it just kind of petered out and, and it just grew sporadically. So this year we're planting smaller successions so that we have fever few to harvest for a much longer growing season. And um, I mean, that was a big one and we remembered that, but there are lots of little things that if we wouldn't have wrote, written them down, we probably would have forgot for this year's, for planning for this year. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ian to talk about the equipment and supplies you'll need. All right. Thanks, Katie. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank everyone for putting in the chat um, that info that we started out with. Looks like we have so many gardeners and farmers all across the United States. And I even saw someone from Argentina, but everybody sounds really excited to try growing their own bouquets, which that's what we're here for. That's awesome. So getting into the greenhouse here. Why are we talking greenhouse and why is this such a big part of the, the presentation? Well, put simply, most cut flower growers um, want to start their, their flowers from seed because it's a lot more cost effective to do it that way than to be buying plants from a nursery nearby. And that's how we do it here. Um, we just built a small greenhouse over the winter. Um, and please note this, um, this slide of equipment and supplies, these things are recommended, but not necessarily required, especially if you're just starting out. You probably don't want to rush out and buy all this stuff. Um, you want to see what works for your operation and what you think you're going to need, and then maybe fine tune it from year to year. But yeah, a greenhouse is pretty important, and, it, and it, they can cost $100,000 plus, dollars, but they don't have to be that way. You can build one fairly affordably if you don't mind putting putting the labor in, both with building it and uh, managing it, um, because you do want it to be heated and ventilated. Um, so we have we don't really have a central thermostat, but we do have a heater and we have ventilation fans and vents. So we try to maintain a, a temperature between mid sixties to mid eighties. Um, high, low, somewhere in that range. But we built our greenhouse with an old high tunnel frame and we double covered it with um, plastic and put a blower, inflation blower in between. And it's been working fine for us so far. 
Um, if we can get through this really rainy weather, um, I think we're going to have a really good start to our season. Next on the list, um, you'll want to think about tables. Um, the big thing with your greenhouse tables or benches, they're sometimes called, is that you want them to be level and offer drainage. Uh, Katie did an amazing job building uh, 10 tables for our greenhouse. Uh, they were right around $100 each, I think possibly even a little less than that. So they can be built affordably at home fairly easily. Supplemental lighting, um, specifically LEDs, uh, which are just everywhere on the market now and fairly affordable, they're a good idea to add to your greenhouse. And I'll talk more about that later. Next, you'll want some way to germinate your seeds involving heat. Some people might make a germination chamber. Uh, we've been considering that for future years, but right now we use a heat mat. Um, and that just allows the, the grower to set a soil temp, soil temperature, and then maintain that. Um, and a lot of our seeds uh, cut flowers and otherwise like it warmer, so 70 degree, 80 degree range, um, and they'll germinate much better that way. A fertilizer injector is probably something you'll want to think about um, maybe your second, third year of greenhouse growing. Um, we just have a simple Venturi style gravity fed injector. Um, those can be as little as $40, $50. But you could also invest in a dosatron down the road, and that will be much more precise um, in the fertilization that you're giving your plants. But the way fertilizer injectors work is that they add very small amounts of fertilizer to the water as you're irrigating or watering your greenhouse crops. Next up here to consider would be your potting mix. And because we're certified organic, we purchase um, a mix called Pro Mix, and it's available at a few of our local suppliers. Um, and we purchased the MP Organic with Mycorrhizae, so that is certified organic. And we blend that with compost and a balanced organic fertilizer as well. And that helps um, release consistent nutrients into your plants' roots as they need it over time. So doing that really cuts down on the amount of uh, fertilization you need to do throughout uh, the life cycle of the plants in the greenhouse. So just, you know, keeping in mind compost, maybe a slow release fertilizer in addition to the potting mix, because a lot of the times the potting mix won't have a lot of nutrients for your plants. Fertilizers and pesticides uh, are good to have on hand. However, um, pesticides would be in the case you have something like aphids all over your Domfrina, something like that. We've had that in the past. Um, and you'll want to scout for pests often. And there are certified organic ways to deal with them, such as um, neem oil, organic, and of course, keeping pests out and keeping your greenhouse as weed free and clean as possible. On the right hand column on this slide, these are mostly your consumables that you're going to be um, buying in and just using. So things like your seed, uh, vermiculite, which is a great amendment to keep moisture in uh, where the seeds need it at the surface of the soil. Um, your seed trays, humidity domes, which I'll talk a little more about later, um, breakaway packs. So those are the larger packs that you'll be um, transplanting your flowers up into, plant tags, um, dibbles, and Sharpies, which we actually use Sharpies as dibbles. <laughs> so could have saved some text there. And these are just a few photos of the, the items I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, our, our heat mat on the top left, then our soil mix with compost on the top right, and then our vermiculite down below. Continuing on with greenhouse growing here, something you want to keep in mind um, as you're growing is that you don't want to forget to keep checking your seed packets because they have all the information typically that you'll need for planning your greenhouse season. 
And if the info isn't on the seed pack, typically the, the website of the seed distributor will have all that information. Uh, Katie mentioned Johnny's selected seeds. They're, they're an excellent resource. Um, they have all the information we need online and we, we look up the information quite often because it's hard to memorize what um, each individual plant needs in terms of conditions. But this brings us to scheduling. And of course, um, spreadsheets are really helpful um, especially with the, the dates you want to be seeding and transplanting into the field, the number of flowers you need, the cell pack size that you'll be seeding and transplanting into, um, things of that nature you'll want to have uh, planned out before the season starts um, so that you're ready to hit the ground running when the time does come. Uh, sounds like a lot, but really you just want to keep in mind how many flowers you're gonna need for the bouquets that you're planning to sell. Um, and you'll figure that out after your first season. Um, also, how quickly or slowly the flowers grow and are gonna be ready to plant in the field. For example, um, echinacea is gonna grow a lot slower than zinnias. So you don't wanna start them at the same time. <laughs> They're gonna be, um, you're gonna have huge zinnias that are outgrowing their packs. and echinacea that's barely even this big. So yeah, timing is everything with managing a greenhouse. Setting the temperature is also something important to think about. And I, I talked a little bit earlier about the temperature range we try to aim for, but if you wanna quick speed up your growth a little bit, you can run your house on the warmer side, especially at nighttime. But if you realized, you know, I started my plants a little too early here, uh, I want to hold them um, until the frost is cleared, um, you could set your, your temperature a little cooler. So just, just a couple tricks there. In terms of germination, as I mentioned before, warmth is important, but also keeping moisture um, near the seeds is really important as well. And we use humidity domes to, to help with that, both keep heat and moisture in. And you know, watering is really important and some people um, don't really think about it, but um, a lot of common greenhouse issues are caused by overwatering, which is our natural inclination is to overwater. So um, stunting, disease, discoloration, pest attraction um, can all be um, sometimes that can come from overwatering. So just get a feel for how heavy your, your trays should be when they're watered just right. And then um, just maintain that. Pests and disease can come up in the greenhouse. So um, checking for those every day as you're watering is important and dealing with them um, with organic approved methods is um, something that can correct um, the issue if you need to. Finally, um, fertilizing and fertigating. As I mentioned, if you add fertilizer to your soil, there's less of a need for fertigating, but we typically do. Um, we will fertigate our greenhouse crops if they're showing physiological signs of being nutrient deficient. Um, if the leaves are turning yellow, um, might be deficient in nitrogen. Um, red might be phosphorus. A few more tips here um, for the greenhouse. You don't wanna start your seeds in cells that are too large. Um, it's better to start them in cells that are small and then transplant them up later. And that can avoid issues with overwatering and um, stunted development, things like that. Um, so we typically use um, 200s, 128s, um, so the really small cells for our slow growing crops. And then the faster growing flowers will use our 72s and our 50s. LED lights are really helpful if you're going through weather like we have here right now in Pennsylvania, which is really um, rainy, overcast, like five days at a time. And if you get some flowers starting to germinate in this weather, they're gonna get stretchy. So we try to get them underneath our LED lights right as they're starting to sprout, and that will help them stay stocky 
and um, healthy. And humidity domes, there again, yep, they're they're worth it. They can help um, keep the soil moist if you're not able to mist your plants every hour of the day. They're worth the investment. Great. So we are about halfway through. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them. We'll, we're also going to have another Q&A session at the end if we have time. Um, so I have one here from Maria. She asks, can I grow plants in my basement with grow lights instead of building a greenhouse? So um, yes, you can. However, they're not going to be as happy. Um, grow lights do not put off nearly as much light as the sun does. So your plants might get stretchy. Um, you might have issues with humidity if unless you set up fans and maybe a dehumidifier down there. Um, and then when you take those plants outside to put them underneath the sun, you're going to want to kind of do the same thing you would do when you harden off plants, just introduce them gradually into the light or they can get sunburned. We actually, when we first started here at Cornwall Manor, we were growing plants indoors with grow lights and it worked out okay for most crops, um, but we definitely had some issues and we're very grateful now that we have a greenhouse. So it can be done, but not ideal if you can afford to build a greenhouse or if you can make it happen. I'll wait a couple more seconds. Oh, here's another question. So Tanya says she bought pot marigold seeds. The directions say to germinate at 60, 70 degrees. Does that mean not put them on a heat mat? Yes, as long as your growing space is that room temperature, they would be fine, not on a heat mat. Um, so hopefully that answers that. And then Maria asks, what fillers do you grow? So we tend to think of fillers as the tiny little flowers like um, yarrow or feverfew. Um, some other people consider fillers to be more of the greenery like uh, sage or euphorbia, um, but we can definitely, I don't know that we have anywhere in this slideshow a list of different flowers, but Maria, I'm happy to send you like a list, a more specific list of the flowers that we grow if you'd like. So Kelly, we're gonna talk later on about where and how to sell your flowers. So we'll address that question later on. Then Maria asks, how do pollinators play a role in your garden space? Uh, Ian, do you wanna answer that one? Oh, sure, yeah. We, um, gosh, we just try to get as much biodiversity on the farm as possible. So we actually, even in our production fields, we'll plant alyssum between maybe our tomatoes to try to just increase the pollination around there because pollinators are attracted to the area. Um, they're also, gosh, they're just important. It means that the, the ecosystem around you is healthy if you see a lot of honeybees. So it's just a good practice just to um, practice regenerative ag. Okay. Um, so we're going to answer some more questions at the end. Uh, do you want to continue with the presentation? Sure. Yeah. Well, sounds good. Thanks everyone for the questions. All right. We're finished in the greenhouse now. It's early May or um, the time of year that you're starting to think about um, planting out in the field. I'm gonna start here with annual flowers. My advice would be not to overthink um, the field prep and planting portion of everything. Um, if you're familiar with vegetable gardening, uh, flowers are really less fussy than vegetables in most cases. So if you're preparing your ve vegetable garden and you're putting flowers in, um, you, should have, you should have some luck there. And we, we were surprised how well flowers grew our first season um, in our soil. But whatever you decide to, to do in terms of your, your flower field, we, we recommend using cover crops and compost during the off season. Uh, you could spread your compost in the fall or the spring just before um, you start to till. And in terms of cover crops, we like our legumes because they do add nitrogen to the soil. And we grew field peas this past season and we're starting to till those in now. And we've also grown crimson clover in the past, but cover crops are important. There's plenty of information on Rodale's website about choosing cover crops. 
Um, and also they have information on where to find more about cover crops, but it's an important part. When it's time to till, it really depends on your scale. You could use a small walk behind rototiller. When we have a little Troy built that we use in our hoop houses and our smaller areas, but on our um, sort of scale where we're, we're gonna be close to 0.15 acres in terms of our flowers this year, we use tractor implements to plow, disc, and then rototill the area uh, before planting. And that's, that's how we do it. Uh, we're hoping to work toward uh, minimal till in the future. Uh, and then Rodale always talks about how no-till and minimal till can improve soil health. And that is important to keep in mind if you're able to do that, um, if you have the right, the nice soil till to make that possible. Finally, you can also throw around a balanced fertilizer that of course is organic approved in your field before you plant. And that brings us to Katie, who's gonna talk about raised beds. Yeah. So uh, after you've done all your field prep and it gets time to actually put your flowers in the ground, we like to use raised beds. Raised beds help keep the soil dryer. Um, if there is any standing water in your field, it'll end up in those pathways instead of keeping your plants roots wet. Raised beds also heat up faster. Um, and we use black plastic in our flower fields uh, just because it keeps the moisture in. We have irrigation lines running underneath that plastic. So it helps keep that irrigation in. It also helps a lot with weeds. That way the weeds might come up in the pathways, but they're not coming up around and competing with the flowers. Some other options to use if you don't want to use black plastic, which I totally understand, or if you just don't have the ability to lay it, you could use straw mulch, you could use wood chips, uh, you could use just bare soil if you want to be hoeing those weeds. The only thing with bare soil is that you want to make sure that you're not losing your topsoil to erosion if you get heavy rains or anything like that, or, or, or if you're in a windy place. And then, like I said, we have drip line running underneath each of those rows of black plastic that we have hooked up to an irrigation system. But if you don't have that ability or if you don't want to do it that way, you could also use overhead sprinklers for irrigation. Um, you could use a hose if you're on a really small scale, just use a hose or a watering can on a super tiny scale. But yeah, you want to have a way to water your plants. And then... Um, Drip irrigation is really the best way because it keeps water off the, the flowers. I mean, obviously they're gonna get rained on unless you have them growing in a tunnel, but as, as much as you can keep them dry, that's really gonna be better for your flowers. And then the last thing I wanna mention is that we use this uh, netting called Hordo Nova. It is just like four inch squares of little plastic that keeps the plants upright. And you just put stakes along the edges of your beds and you can string the netting over top of it. It's reusable season after season, and it'll really help keep keep some of those floppier flowers from falling over so that you have straighter stems. Is that it? Yeah, back to you. Okay. So this slide just shows a couple different scales of growing cut flowers. On the right, that would be Rodale's main campus up in Kutztown, where we do have kind of a public garden type feel to our cut flower garden. But nonetheless, a lot of flowers are grown for our weddings and our events. Um, and that's just done by a lot of hand tilling and planting and hand weeding. So that's one way to do it if you have a small garden and it's productive. On the left, that is our, our farm in Lebanon County, the Trailside Farm. And we do it a little more uh, production style, the same way that you'd see us growing our tomatoes or our squash. So everything's in uniform rows, uh, but most of the time, the same type of flower is grown for most, if not all of that row. And that makes harvesting and identifying issues really easy and streamlined. Now moving on here to um, perennials from our talk about growing annual flowers. Perennials are really popular because they, they certainly add that um, farm flower or that native look to a bouquet and they can add a really nice pop of texture. Um, they're just a lot of fun too. And they can be low maintenance if you get them set up correctly. So first off, you'll need to have a space that you don't plan on disturbing for at least several years. 
because that's often the amount of time perennials take to really establish and start to thrive. So a lot of the work you'll do with your perennial field or area will be upfront work. So you'll want to rototill and make raised beds similar to the way you would with your annual flowers. And you're going to want to plant in a similar way. But here we use wood chips to mulch rather than black plastic because we can't keep black plastic down for more than one season because of organic requirements. Um, you'll also want to keep up with watering them well the first season. And then the first and second and probably even a little bit the third season, you'll want to weed, spot water, prune back your perennials. Um, just keep an eye on everything. Make sure everything's thriving. Reseeding often happens um, after your plants start to thrive and they'll eventually begin to outcompete weeds and your perennial area will be more self-sufficient than maybe even your annual field. Currently, perennials aren't a major component of our bouquets. They're just kind of a small amount when they're in season, but we're hoping as our field, which is pictured in this slide, begins to uh, really spread and grow that we'll be able to add more perennials to our bouquets. And some people will, they like, they ask us for wildflower bouquets. Well, that's a good way to do it. Here's some photos of the equipment that Katie and I have been talking about, just so you can put an image to what we've been mentioning. On the left, that's how we get our tilling done. So a double bottom plow on our tractor, a disc on our tractor. Uh, we also have a tractor mount prototiller, which is a 72 inch. So a really wide, um, easy way to till a big area. Then you, you have your little walk behind rototiller, which works plenty well. On the right, um, back to raised beds here, that piece of equipment's called a bed former. And it'll do three things in one pass. It'll one, make the raised bed, it'll form it. Two, it'll lay your drip line, your irrigation. And three, it'll cover everything with that plastic mulch Katie was talking about. And the finished product is right there on the, on the left. Uh, those, we use white plastic that year, um, but there's a lot of options in terms of width and um, color. Let's talk now a bit about maintaining your, your plants. And this is mostly going back to your annual field now, because that, like I said, that's most of what we grow. So you'll want to prune your flowers often, even if you aren't really planning on harvesting that day, or you don't want more of that particular flower. If, if they're starting to be past their prime, you want to cut them off. And that does a few different things, uh, most of which would be, um, it keeps the, the plant blooming and healthy. Number two would be irrigating in terms of plant maintenance. So what we do um, usually on a daily basis is put our finger a couple inches into the soil to see um, how moist the soil is below the surface um, where the plant's roots are. And this will tell you if watering is needed. If it's pretty saturated through, then you probably don't want to water anymore because your, your plants aren't going to like being drowned. <laughs> but if it is a little dry, yeah, it's time to turn on that, that drip irrigation or use your hose to water or however you decide to do it. As I mentioned before, if your plants are showing those physiological signs of being short on nutrients, you can give them a boost um, with fertigating. And we typically in the field will use a fish emulsion fertilizer, which is a balanced, it's a 3-4-3 fertilizer, and that's water soluble in a way we can send fertilizer through our drip lines um, right to the plant's roots. So very efficient and easy way of doing things. A lot of, I think people don't realize how important it is to keep weeds down um, and keep mowing happening around your flowers because they'll start to compete with the growing space of the roots and on um, the growing space above ground as well. So keeping those weeds pulled and the grasses down around your, your flowers is important. And we do a lot of this by hand 
um, with a, a push mower or a weed whacker, or we're hand pulling weeds out of the holes in the black plastic. So that's some, some work you're gonna have to put in, but you should see that pay off in terms of your, your yield of flowers. And finally, just like in the greenhouse, there's always that potential for pests and disease to be an issue. For example, we get powdery mildew on our zinnias and our annual rubecchia as well. And so we have some OMRI listed fungicides Omri being the Organic Materials Review Institute. Um, they basically say if something is organic approved to use, and there are options, um, beam oil, pyganic, and then fungicides, there's, there's plenty of organic ways to, to do things. On the left of this slide, those are some photos of our drip irrigation close up. So you can see kind of what that is. Um, we typically piece together our irrigation every season using the fittings in that picture. And we'll run a header line from our hydrants down to each row of, of drip. Also another nice tool to have would be that red timer pictured on that bottom left picture. And that allows you to set a specific time you want your irrigation to run. And you can simply walk away and forget about it rather than risking uh, leaving the irrigation on and flooding your field. Yeah, I highly recommend them. They're, gosh, probably $15 at post. In terms of maintenance, there's our, our push mower, our weed whacker, pruners to, to keep plants cut back. A hose if you're establishing your perennial beds and you want to keep weeds down. So we do a lot of that, um, those sorts of things by hand. We don't use any herbicides, uh, mostly small scale organic farming here, market garden style. Okay. Here's Katie to talk about harvesting equipment and supplies. Cool. So there's just a couple more things that you're going to need when it is time to harvest your, your flowers and make bouquets. Um, you're going to need buckets for sure, something to put the flowers in as you're harvesting them. We like these little two to three gallon buckets. They're pretty cheap. Um, you're probably going to need more buckets than you think you'll need. So stock up on those. We put almost all of our flowers in those. The only thing we use bigger buckets for are sunflowers because they're so top heavy. We put those in five gallon buckets because they tend to tip over these smaller buckets. Do you just want to make sure that when you're filling up your bucket that all the flower heads are above the rim of the bucket so that the petals aren't getting crushed? Other things you're going to need are a pair of pruners. I like the little needle nose type that are pictured here. Um, I find that it's easier to get in between stems and cut the stem that I want and not the other ones with the, the needle nose type. You're going to need rubber bands for when you're making bouquets. If you are selling your bouquets at a farmer's market or directly to customers, you're probably going to want produce bags so that you can wrap them around the bottom of those bouquets so they're not dripping all over your customers. If you're going to be shipping your bouquets or if you're selling them to a grocery store or something, you might want flower sleeves. We don't use them for our small on-site market, on market, but they are definitely an option. Flower food's optional too, whether you wanna put it in the buckets of water that you have your bouquets stored in, or if you wanna include packets along with your bouquets. And then if you're gonna be shipping your flowers or transporting them for long distances, you might wanna consider flower boxes, which are just like tall skinny boxes that will fit the bucket at the bottom and then have room for the bouquet sticking out. Well, they don't stick out of the top of the box, but room in the box to protect it during transport. So when you're harvesting flowers, you want to do it as early in the day as possible before the heat of the sun starts to dry out those flowers. The only stipulation to that would be if it had rained overnight or if it's a really dewy morning and kind of want to let some of that dew or that rainwater dry off the flowers. You don't want to harvest them when, when they're dripping wet, but you want to get them before noon or 2 p.m. when they're, you know, kind of baking in the sun. So as soon as you harvest, you want to remove the leaves and the side stems. You can keep a couple of the leaves up close to the flower, but you want to get rid of most of them because they are not going to benefit the plant at all. They're just going to suck nutrients out of the stem that the flower needs. And um, 
and they're not they're not useful. And then you want to immediately put the flower into water before the the cut part of the stem has time to scab over. And you want to get them out of the sun. You don't have to immediately take them inside, but if you just have some shade of a tree or your harvest vehicle or something somewhere that you can set your buckets as you're finishing them um, out of the sun before before they start to wilt, because once they're cut, they don't want the sunlight anymore. Okay, so then as soon as you can get them inside, do it, um, whether that's into air conditioning, into a shaded barn, or if you have refrigeration, that is great. Um, we have a walk-in cooler, we're very grateful for that. Uh, the lower the temperature, the better, but not freezing. Most flowers wanna be stored somewhere between 32 and 35 degrees. Um, so if you can get them into a walk-in cooler, that would be great. Or even if you have just an extra house refrigerator, you get a couple buckets in that. Some exceptions to that 32 to 35 degrees would be tropical flowers, whether you're purchasing them in dad or bouquets, or if you happen to be growing them in a greenhouse or a tunnel, uh, those obviously want to be a little bit warmer since they're tropical basils. And we found that straw flower all would rather be stored either between 50 or 55 if you have that option or just at room temperature. That'll help those last longer. Basil definitely gets damaged if you put it in your refrigerator at like a normal fridge temperature. So when you are making bouquets, you want them to be consistent. You want the sizes to be consistent for the same price point. You don't want to sell one person a $10 bouquet that's you know this big and the next person gets one that's that big. That just doesn't make sense. So the easiest way when you're first starting out before you get a feel for you know how big your bouquet should be is to just do it by stem count. That's still how we do it here at the farm. It's the easiest for us. So when I'm harvesting, I will go down and make a list like you see here. So on this example day, we harvested 60 gumfrina, 30 sunflowers, 75 zinnias, et cetera. And then I'll add up all of those numbers so that I have a total stem count, which in this case is 385. I will then divide that by how many stems I want to put in each bouquet. So in this case, it's 25. We found for our market that 25 is a good number for the size bouquet that we want to be selling. So then I get 15 bouquets, and then I can divide each of those numbers again by 15 so that I know that in each bouquet, I will have four gumfrina, two sunflowers, five zinnias, etc. And that, I don't stick to that rigidly, but it gives me a really good idea when I'm making bouquets that they're all going to look pretty consistent. And I'm not going to end up at the end with like no zinnias left over and, you know, a hundred gumfrina. So, so that's a, a good way to make sure that your bouquets are all kind of the same. So then when we go to make bouquets, we line them all up on a table. I like to have each variety in its own bucket if possible. Sometimes if things have smaller stems or a fewer number of stems, I could put two or three in a, in a bucket, but ideally each variety in its own bucket. And we line them up on the table kind of in the order that I like to build bouquets. So the way I like to do it, I like to have greens, fillers, spikes and movement flowers, and then face flowers. I think and then, yeah, the next slide. Oh, do you wanna play that little video? Yeah, so there you can see our bouquets or our flowers kind of sitting out there ready to be made into bouquets. So when it's time to make the bouquets, I will grab, like I said, a couple greens and I'll kind of work in a circle around them. I'm shooting for kind of like an ice cream cone shape. So I always, I hold down at the base of the stem that allows the flowers to stay open and not be like smooshed together. And it'll make the bouquets look better, look bigger without actually adding any more flowers into them. So I'll start with my greens and then I'll add some of those little filler flowers like fever few. I'll add some, uh, some of the spikes, like if we have grasses or if we have celosia, I'll add some of those in. And then I'll go around and I'll add some of the face flowers in like zinnias or rudbeckia or sunflowers. And then I'll kind of hold it back and look at it, look at it down from the top and see if there are any gaps either where there are just no flowers and I need to add something or if uh, I have a gap in color, like if one side is really heavy with yellow and the other side is kind of lacking, I can add a yellow flower onto the other side and just kind of tweak it there just until it looks good and even. Um, 
Then you want to cut the stems all off at the same length. You want to make sure that they're all going to end up in the water. So if you look at the bouquet from the bottom, looking up the stems, if you see any that are still pretty far up, you can just pull them down a little bit just so that they end up in the water. Wrap your rubber band around pretty low on the stem so that you can still keep the bouquet loose and open at the top. And then if you're using flower sleeves, put it in the flower sleeve and put it back into the water. Great. Um, Ian, you're going to talk about retail sales? All right. Yep, that's right. So number one, a lot of you are probably wondering about pricing, how much you should be charging for your bouquets. And I'd say this would have a lot to do with your local markets um, and what people are willing to pay in your area. So my, my advice would be to check with other local growers of cut flowers and see what they're charging. Maybe stop by their stand or talk to them or however you'd like to do it. Um, and that should give you a good gauge of what, what you should be charging. And of course, that also depends on how you're marketing them and where you're selling them. Other ways to stay diversified in your cut flower operation would be to consider things besides just the traditional bouquets that we've been talking a lot about. So one example at the top would be single variety bunches. These would be things like sunflowers, um, maybe even in the fall when you, you're getting a lot of sunflowers in and people are interested in them, you could um, bunch up five, six, seven sunflowers and sell a bunch of those for a similar price point as a bouquet. So it gives your customer a little bit of choice. Um, and maybe they're in the mood, they just want um, a bunch of sunflowers. Um, and we grow the, while we're talking about sunflowers, we grow the, the Pro Cut series and they come in a, a wide variety of colors and they're awesome, highly recommended. You could also offer um, at the farm or where you're selling your flowers, single stems, which you would pay by the stem and give your customer the choice to build their own bouquet. Maybe they have a favorite flower or they're looking for a gift for somebody who really likes a specific type of flower. That's one way to add some variety and attract more customers. Pick your own at the farm is something that I've been noticing more of in this uh, part of the country where people come out to your farm, not necessarily because they really want a bouquet of flowers, but because they want an activity, maybe with their grandkids or they're on a date and they want to go um, out and do something. So they're paying more for the, the interactive experience of being on the farm than just the bouquet, because there's only going to be so many customers that want a bouquet. Maybe that would be a way to um, increase your sales um, and really showcase your farm as a part of it. Finally, thinking about dried bouquets would be a way to have a product even in the off season. So if you have a surplus of certain flowers like straw flower, status, gomphrina, celosia, things like that, you could dry them during the heat of the summer and save them for the winter and then offer something uh, Katie called everlasting bouquets, which um, would be a way to keep, keep some sales going and even in the winter. Well, so hopefully you, before you start growing flowers, you're going to think about where you're going to be selling them and you're just going to grow them and then try to find a customer. Um, but here are some other things that you could consider. Uh, you could have a roadside stand if you live on a well-traveled route. One thing to think about with that, though, would be talking to the township about whether you need a permit to up to erect a structure um, and if you need any kind of off-street parking. You could sell them at a farmer's market, either having your own stand or if you want to partner up with somebody who has a well-established stand there. You could have bouquet making events. You could take your show on the road to, to other people's events. Or um, there's one local grower near us who has this cute old Ford pickup truck that she turned into a flower truck. She puts buckets of flowers in the back of it and takes it to like street fairs and things like that. And then people can kind of go around each flower is individually priced and they, they just make their own bouquet and then pay for it at the end. That's a super cute creative idea that I've seen locally that I like. 
Um, you could consider wholesaling your bouquets to a grocery store, or you could wholesale by the stem to local florists who are doing uh, weddings and other events, things like that. There are lots of options, uh, ways to sell flowers if you just like get a little creative with it and, and think about, yeah, what are the possibilities? All right, that is it. So it is time for some questions. We do have some in the chat, if or not in the chat, in the Q&A box. If you have any more questions and you want to put them in there, we have, what, about five or six minutes to answer some questions? Yeah, we could go over a little, too, if um, it takes some time. Cool. Yeah. So I'm looking at one at the top here um, about dealing with fungus gnats in the greenhouse. And I think if I were in that situation, which we haven't, we haven't had those in the greenhouse yet, but I think running your, your house a little on the dry side, um, maybe during a few sunny days would help. And also um, before, I, I would say in the evening, if you drench down the soil a bit with Piganic, um, that, that should help kill the gnats and keep them knocked down for a little bit. Um, yeah. but yeah, just make sure not to do that during the day in the sunlight. And that's, yeah. that's how I would approach it. What do you yeah, think? Yeah. Yellow sticky traps are also really good at attracting those adult nut fungus gnats. I have them at my house right now and it's driving me a little bit crazy. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> I can't wait for the weather where I can get those plants outside. Sure. Okay. So Deborah asked for small areas. Can can you grow a lot of flowers in several raised beds? I think the answer, if you have good soil, you'd be surprised how many flowers you could grow in a small area and how well they'll do. Um, so I'd say, yeah, you could grow a lot of different types um, and with, with success. And you'd probably be surprised how many flowers you'll get for bouquets. Okay, Jennifer asks uh, if we seed a cover crop on our pathways. Your photos oh. <laughs> before flowers are planted after beds are made showing bare soil versus the soil of zinnias showing something. Yeah, so those are weeds growing in the pathways, um, mostly grasses, which we mowed. This year, however, we're going to try to get, well, we are going to get a cover crop in there of um, oats and clover and try to get that established and see if it makes a difference, if, if it can outcompete the weeds, because we'd really yeah rather have a cover crop growing in those pathways than weeds. But anything really is better than bare soil in our case, just so to, to help keep the soil in place so it's not eroding. Okay. Okay, down, down here, it, um, Tanya says, um, or asks, I should say, do you mean basil like the herb used in a bouquet? Well, we grow, a, there's a few different types of basils that can be used as fillers in bouquets or greens in bouquets. We use one called cardinal basil, which is available through Johnny's. And that's a type that you can cut uh, for flowers. It's not so much a culinary type, but it does have the same aroma. And it also gets flowers that attract all kinds of pollinators when they're in the field and it adds kind of a nice pop of green and red color to a bouquet. So um, yeah, kind of a, an interesting one that, that we're gonna try growing this year too. Two other varieties I've used in bouquets um, in the past, uh, purple amethyst is a really pretty purple basil and Mrs. Burns lemon has a really nice lemon scent and that one um, you can cook with it, I guess, but most people use it for floral arrangements because um, it smells really nice and gets like a cute little delicate you know, basil looking mm -hmm. flower on the top of it. I'm going to answer Kevin's question um, because I would I went back and forth with him a little bit. Um, Kevin asks if we yeah. use any kind of hardy or woody ingredients in our bouquets like nine bark or hydrangea. We don't yet okay. because our farm is so new. We don't really have any kind of perennials of that size or scope um, on the farm, uh, but I have seen that and it can look really nice in bouquets if that's something that you have available to you. Sorry about my light, guys. Okay. It's on a timer and it keeps yeah, that, the time out. It seems to be too quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Hannah asks, could you repeat the list of examples of flowers which would be good for dried bouquets? Um, I'll give it a shot and Katie can back me up because Katie has more experience than me. Katie worked at a flower farm, which is awesome. But um, things like gomperina are awesome. Celosia. Um, some of the, some of the grasses, um, ageratum, would that be one? Ageratum actually doesn't dry very well. It fades okay. to like a brown color. Okay. Um, 
Dusty Miller is a good green. It's it's not really green, but it's kind of like a non-floral filler that you can dry and add into bouquets. Um, I think that you covered most of the rest. A quick Google search will tell you all kinds of options. I'm sure there are some yeah. grasses, um, some like millet type things too that you could dry. Gosh, yeah, I know there. Johnny's has a, a list too. If you use them, they have um, a lot of flowers that can be used as dried flowers, and some of them can be a little tricky to grow, I believe. But uh, the gomphrinas are awesome. They come in all kinds of colors and types. Um, the fireworks series is great. Okay. Any things to avoid or fails? Paul asks. Goodness. What did we not have luck with? I'm trying to think. Um, I definitely know that there were some things that were like, we're not growing that again. Um, scabiosa is one that we haven't quite mastered yet. Uh, we had a really hard time yeah. figuring out when to cut it so that all the little petals didn't fall off really quickly. So I think we're avoiding that one. Um Oh gosh, yeah. bachelor's buttons were really difficult to harvest and the stems were so fragile. Although they look great, we just decided we're not going to grow them this year because they're too much work. Say those two. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, and your, you know, experience might be different, you know, so just try things. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, for the next year. Yeah. Okay, below that, we have an anonymous question that asks, how often did you say you're fertilizing or fertigating? And this would depend a lot on your soil and you might be able to save some money in inputs by not really doing that at all if you have really nice soil. Like up at our main campus in Kutztown, we don't fertilize very much because we have composted so much that the new, the nutrition is in the soil and the, the microbiology is there to help the plants take it up. But um, I do know that our, our fish emulsion says every three weeks during the growing season is kind of a good, um, you know, general idea of when you'll want to fertigate. But I'm um, just checking how the plants look. Um, if they're showing signs of needing it, you can always fertilize as on an as needed basis. That's a good way to do it too. Danielle asks, what are our top three selling flowers? That's hard to say because we put almost everything we sell into bouquets. So it's kind of very mixed. Um, but I would say what people are most excited about would be the zinnias, sunflowers, and... No, what do you think of the third one? Maybe Gosh. I don't know. I keep I always go back to Gomperina. I love Gomperina. Yeah. Um, but Zinnia sunflowers, we got a we grew a, a type of Rudeckia called Indian Summer. And that was oh, yeah. that was really cool because it produced so well. And also it has that wildflower look that people like. But we, we actually found that we grew too many yellow flowers last year. So we're trying to cut back on the amount of yellow this year. Those are, yeah, those are some popular ones, especially the, the sunflowers. We have great luck just selling bunches of those. And the, the pro cut sunflowers come in like pure red. They come in lemon and orange and bicolor mixes. And so, yeah, th those would be our number one for sure. Um, here's someone asks how many different varieties we grow. Um, boy, I don't, I don't know <laughs> exactly. Maybe like 30 to 40 ish. I mean, yeah, the, we... the main ones were on that list. And if you'd like that, a copy of that, that list, I can send that. But... Yeah. There's some things we grow multiple varieties of the same flower family. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Okay, below that, are there any flowers to avoid planting next slash near each other? And I'd say, yeah, probably if you have a flower that gets really tall, like zinnias, you don't want to plant that directly next to something that stays short, um, like, oh goodness, something like feverfew, or we grew something called talonum, and those stay close to the ground, and the, the zinnias could shade those out. But in terms of just, you know, soil, I don't think there's there's much of an issue, but 
Um, that would be more of a sunlight problem. Helen and Kelly asks or says, I guess we'd like to do an entire field of sunflowers on our farm for an agro-tourism feature. Draw for booking photography sessions. Do oh, you yeah. have any recommendations yeah, on where to buy seeds in bulk? That's a good question. Okay. Goodness, yeah. I, uh, most of our seeds that we purchase would be um, smaller quantities. And that those the sunflowers we grow are single stem, um, really sturdy cut flower varieties. They're going to be probably more expensive than you want. I gosh, I could ask somebody um, at Rodale that purchases bulk seeds and get back to you. I know um, some people purchase cover crop sunflower seeds for that, that purpose. I think we use a company called Albert Lee. I'm not sure if they have sunflowers, but that could be worth a shot. And they do offer certified organic seed. But yeah, I would look into if you're going to search it, cover crop sunflowers or, um, you know, oil production sunflowers, something that would be sold on a, a larger scale than what we grow. Okay, so that's about all the time we have. Um, if there are, I think that's about all the questions too. We have one more I can okay, quick cool. answer. We might have yeah. um, Do you purchase any plugs? And the answer there would be no. We grow everything from seed. Um, but that is a way that, gosh, a lot of nurseries do it. And it, that can still be um, cost effective to do it that way. But we don't do it that way. Cool. Okay, I think that about wraps it up. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs> we hope that was informative. And um, like we mentioned before, please don't hesitate to email us if you have any more questions.